So I wanted basically to, to uh, share with you a bunch of things that I think are useful to understand uh, machine learning in the context of neuroimaging and in a, in a broader context also. Uh, things that we've learned uh, you know, through time uh, without being too bleeding edge. Uh, and this is uh, weekly based on, on scikit-learn and nilearn, uh, of course. So I'm, I'm going to start a bit with a, a bit of um, um, uh, notions on, on computational scalability uh, because it, it helps to understand a bit, a bit what you're doing here. Uh, of course, if you're using deep learning, you're already using uh, some of those tricks, uh, but they're useful outside. Then I'll move to a bit more advanced estimators. Uh, so one thing is I, I won't mention, I won't talk really about deep learning because, uh, well, for several reasons, but um, on many of the problems that we have in neuroimaging, it's not useful. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention why at the end of the day, I, I, I think it's, it's counterproductive. Uh, finally, I'll talk a bit about some advanced learners that we've done on brain images. And, and here the idea is to, uh, you know, give you ideas on how we've combined those, those notions. And, and, and last but not least, I'll dwell a tiny amount in principles of machine learning and, and you know, the theoretical framing that, that is behind, behind all this. Uh, so, when I, I'm, I mean large scale, I mean your data doesn't fit in, in memory. Uh, and that could be for multiple reasons. You might only have a, a not huge amount of uh, a samples, but uh, you might have extremely uh, large data. Uh, so uh, the, the first thing that you can do to tackle, uh, oh, I forgot to say, I, I would really uh, you know, love questions. Uh, I'm monitoring the chat here. Uh, okay, we, we'll help you with that. We're going to monitor the chat and, uh, and interrupt you so that you can concentrate on the talk while uh, we are monitoring the questions. Very good, very good. So yeah, so I really love you know, questions and discussions. This is something I, I enjoy a lot. Um, so the, 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 first, you know, the first trick in, you can apply that's quite crucial is, is the idea of uh, online algorithms. So if you do, um, uh, if you do deep learning, you, you do this, but you can do this outside of deep learning. And in scikit-learn, the way it works is that some of our algorithms, some of our objects have a partial fit. And the idea of partial fit is that you give to the algorithm chunks of data. And so basically the algorithm is processing chunks and chunks of data. And uh, in deep learning, as well as in our linear models, um, uh, the core um, algorithm that's behind all this is uh, the stochastic gradient descent. And the way you can think of a stochastic gradient descent is, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a minimum, but I only get a, a noisy um, estimate of the direction where this minimum is. And the reason I get a, a noisy estimate of this direction is because I look, uh, uh, I look in a small number of samples each time. Uh, so, uh, it's a bit like asking uh, uh, your, your drunk friend uh, how to go from one place to another place. If you do this, the answer they'll get, they'll give you might be wrong, but we do hope it's going to be uh, correct on, on average. So the idea being that you ask a first friend and the first friend points in a direction and you go in this direction, you know, for a while. And then you ask another friend and you go in, in, in the direction of his answer for a while and again and again and again. Now, if you always go as far in this direction because your friends are giving you directions that point a bit randomly, uh, that are not, um, that have a noise, then basically you're gonna end up going in circles. And actually you're gonna, you're going to end up doing a random walk. So the idea being that as you move forward, you want to do jumps that are smaller and smaller and smaller. Because as you do jumps that are smaller and smaller and smaller, eventually, because your friends are giving you overall good estimates, then you'll land closer and closer and you'll avoid going, you'll avoid going far when you're close. The, in, in stochastic gradient descent, the parameter that controls this is the learning rate. Uh, the idea being that as you move forward, you decrease the learning rate. 
And if you run a lot of stochastic gradient descent, you probably learn to hate this learning rate because it's difficult to tune. So these, these um, uh, estimators here, uh, now the friends are analogous to different features here, they're analogous to different samples. I'm, I, I have many samples, many brain, brain scans, and I'm asking each time different brain scans, what's, where should I go to estimate the best, uh, uh, the best classifier? Uh, so we so we have uh, online algorithms for um, for um, linear models that use uh, stochastic gradient descent, but we also have uh, online algorithms uh, for clustering approaches. Uh, so we can do k-means online. We can do Birch, which is a very fast um, uh, algorithm that scales extremely well. We can do uh, things like a principal component analysis online. We can do things like um, uh, dictionary learning online. And these algorithms for clustering and, and PCA and dictionary learning don't use SGD. They use other um, online approaches. And the, the nice thing is that you don't have a, a learning rate to, to set in those settings. Now, if you have uh, too many features uh, and not only too many samples, you might want to reduce the data uh, in the feature direction. So the idea being that you're gonna take a very, very large uh, feature vector and you're gonna transform it in a smaller feature vector. So the most natural way of doing this would be uh, using a principal component analysis, which by the way, you can fit uh, online using the incremental PCA. Uh, but there are other approaches that work extremely well. You could be using a random projection. Now, random projection, what it will do is it will approximate quite well a PCA. Uh, so it's, it's less optimal than a PCA, but uh, it's um, extremely fast. You can use very fast clustering of features, and I'll come back to this, but the, the intuition you can have is it's like a super pixel strategy. Uh, and if you're dealing with text, uh, you can use um, hashing. The idea being, it's, it's, it's a bit of a trick. Uh, the idea being that you don't have to count all your vocabulary. Uh, you just take hashes of the, of the words. So it's just something you can keep in mind. If ever you need to deal with text, you can use the hashing vectorizer. I will skip this slide in the interest of time because it is less crucial. And I'll move directly to uh, advanced estimators. So if you have text data, once again, I'm talking about text data, uh, you'll, you'll probably have extremely uh, uh, high dimensional vectors. And so you typically are going to focus on linear estimators or uh, a naive base Naive bases, uh, naive base estimators have been shown to work extremely well on text data. So why would you, you know, we're talking brain imaging, so why would you, uh, why would you have text data? Well, you have this the minute you're starting to mine publications, such as in your synth or in your query or any other work that works on mining publications. And typically when you do this, what you're gonna do is that you're gonna count the occurrence of words that is um, uh, that are relevant for the question you're you're interested in. So basically, all the all the words that are relevant for cognitive neuroimaging, you're going to get you know a list of a few thousand words, and then what you're going to do is that for each publication, you're going to count uh, the, the number of times these words occur. Uh, and this you can do with the hashing uh, vectorizer, as mentioned uh, before. Uh, now, if you have this, so um, uh, both uh, the uh, linear estimators and the uh, uh, naive base have online versions uh, where the naive base doesn't need a, a, a learning rate. Uh, and on top of this, if you want to reduce the, the number of features, suppose you know you, you have a vocabulary of 10,000 features, 10,000 10, words, but you, you think actually a small number uh, are useful, then you can use chi-squared feature selection uh, the reason that you're going to use chi-squared feature selection and not um, a standard F-test is that chi-square is adapted to the uh, counting distribution 
of um, uh, those, uh, uh, the, the number of times the word appears. Uh, now, suppose you have heterogeneous uh, uh, columnar data. So what I, what I call heter heterogeneous columnar data is, for instance, some signals that are brain imaging signals, you know, uh, MRI, uh, EG, uh, but also some signals that uh, have, th uh, have different features, such as sociodemographic data or questionnaires. So you get a lot of this in uh, um, population imaging settings, in which case uh, you're going to have uh, very different data distributions. The, the distribution of age has a specific shape. The distribution of income has a specific shape. The geographic coordinates of uh, where someone was born has a very specific shape. Uh, you, might, you might have categorical data. You might have answers to questionnaires that is ordinal, you know, from a scale from one to five. Uh, are you afraid of giving talks? Uh, the, the, the challenge then, then with uh, such, such kind of data is that you need to combine information that are uh, with extremely different distributions. And for these specific problems, the tree methods uh, in general work extremely well. Uh, now, um, the, the, the modern techniques don't use only a single decision tree, I'll, I'll explain them a bit more in detail, they combine many different trees, and uh, the classic estimators uh, that you have in scikit-learn are the random forest or the extra tree classifier. They're pretty much similar, and the histogram uh, gradient boosting classifiers. And I'll come back to that later one. That the histogram gradient boosting classifier is uh, um, a, a classifier. All, all these have a, a regressor version, right? There's the classifier and there's the regressor version. And um, that last one is one on which we've been investing uh, a lot uh, lately because um, really the, the, the current um, state of the art in the industry has shown that it is an extremely good classifier for a very uh, large uh, number of applications. And, and recently uh, we've added native support for missing values or we've added monotonicity constraints uh, and I'll, I'll come back to this. So how can we have an intuition of how a, a decision tree works? Here I'm looking at a, a decision tree regressor. And the idea is that I want to uh, learn to um, basically approximate this function. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the way it's going to work is that it's going to, to learn a set of binary decisions. So I have, you know, I have one variable here x and it's only one variable and i'm going to learn that if x is lower than 3.5 then um i'll come back to the uh, there's a question of missing values i'll come back to the missing values i'll spend a, a significant amount of time on missing values uh, uh but first let's let's uh, let's establish the intuitions on the on the uh, regression trees uh, uh so here the reason that it appears as a staircase is that it's a set of binary decision if x, x is greater than this value, then I'll predict that y has this other value. If it's lower than this value, uh, then I might have another decision, another if-then, right? So I'm chaining if-thens, and as I'm chaining if-thens, I'm building a tree. Uh, but you can see a tree really as a, a locally constant approximation of what you're trying to predict. So locally constant is a fairly bad approximation of a sine wave, right? Uh, so uh, what the ensemble techniques do is that they combine many of these locally constant. And here we're looking at a, a, a gradient boosting approach. What the gradient boosting approach does is that it looks at the error. It, it fits the first model. It looks at the error that the first model does and uh, it tries to compensate for this uh, uh, first model with a second uh, model and then with a third model, and so on and so forth. And so what you, you can see is that if you use many, many models, you're starting to get a much smoother behavior. Uh, so these uh, trees, they have an extremely uh, pleasant property is that they're completely invariant to a monotonic transformation of one axis. So if you have questionnaires and age and weight 
uh, and IQ uh, and brain imaging data, you don't need to rescale them. You don't need to feature transform them in, in any way because uh, the distribution, uh, a, change of, uh, a change of distribution on a single variable doesn't make any difference to the tree uh, based classifier. Another uh, pleasant aspect of these uh, uh, graded boosted regression trees is that there is pretty much only two important parameters. The depth of the tree that typically you take not too uh, uh, deep uh, uh, because you, you want to um, uh, avoid overfit and the learning rate, uh, which is a, a slightly different notion than the learning rate in a, in a stochastic gradient descent, uh, uh, that you uh, also take um, not too big because the bigger you take, the more you tend to, to overfit. So uh, there are default values and typically you need to do a small grid search uh, around those, those default values. But that's only two parameters, which is quite uh, 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 pleasant uh, for a nonlinear model. Another intuition that I'm giving you here is a classification uh, on a two dimensional data set. And what you can see here on the top is a decision tree. And you can see that uh, the, it's, it's no longer staircases because we're in 2D, but it's basically rectangles, right? We're assembling rectangles. And, and the reason that, it, that these are rectangles is that it's a bunch of if-thens on values uh, of uh, one coordinate or another coordinate. So that's for one decision tree. And then if we do a random forest, we have a combination of those decision trees and then the boundaries become uh, more blurred. So I'll, I'll come back to the missing values. Uh, now, um, one last trick uh, that we found very uh, useful is that uh, uh, sometimes you want to combine uh, models, and I'll, I'll come back with examples on brain imaging and why you might want to combine models, but sometimes you want to combine models, uh, combine, for instance, a powerful model such as a, a gradient boosted regression tree with a less powerful model such as uh, a linear model. And, and excuse me, there's a typo in my slide. It should read X gives Z with model one and Z gives Y with model two. So the idea being that we're trying to predict Y from Z, but we're going to use the chain of two models. And uh, this is, this is similar to deep learning, but the difference with model stacking is that we're going to train model one, the first model here, we're going to train it uh, directly to predict Y. And then we're going to use the prediction of model one to uh, uh, train model two, okay? So we're first training model one to predict Y, and then we're using the predictions of, of model one to train a second model to predict uh, a Y. Uh, so why, why would we do this? Well, we might be using a simple model here that will underfit, so uh, give us errors in prediction, and then use a more complex model here. And uh, you can see that it's necessary, well, we, we need to be careful about overfit in the first model because if the first model is perfectly trained to predict Y, uh, then Z equals Y and the second model doesn't do anything. So it's a perfect overfit. So to do this well, you need to, uh, to avoid the overfit. You need to uh, uh, do what's known as cross-fitting, which is that you need to split your train data in an internal cross-validation loop. And each time you're going to, to use, to, to, uh, um, to, to predict your internal variable Z uh, with a, a separated uh, a split of the data. Now, don't try this at home. Don't implement this yourself unless you, you want to learn how it works. Uh, so why would you want to combine, Kendra is asking, why would you want to uh, combine many models uh, uh, instead of a single model? Uh, the reason why you want, might want to combine many models instead of a single model is that you're going to you're going to it's going to make a more expressive model. So the combination of model one and model two is going to be more expressive than model one by itself or model two by itself. 
Now, there's a, it's the same idea as in deep learning, where deep learning, we're also training models. So why won't, would we not want to do deep learning? Well, the, the uh, reason is that model stacking actually needs much less features, no, no, sorry, much less samples uh, uh, than uh, deep learning. In deep learning, what we would do is that we would um, uh, retro, retro propagate an error through those two models. Uh, so the combination of those two models is more powerful. And I'll, later on in, in the second part of my talk, well, in the third part of my talk, uh, uh, I'll give a specific example uh, on brain imaging, and I hope it will be more clear. Uh, if model one underfits, do we not lose potentially re relevant uh, information by using its prediction as input to model two? Uh, it needs to overfit, to underfit, because if it, uh, uh, if it fits predictly, perfectly Y, then model two is useless. Uh, so by construction, if we have a model that perfectly fits Y, model two is, is useless. Uh, I, I, I'll come back to this example when I discuss, um, um, uh, uh, when, when I, I discuss brain imaging, because I hope it will be more clear. I realize I should have, I, I did a first set of slides that was more theoretical, a first section that was more theoretical, and a se second section that was more applied. Uh, uh, but uh, just, just bear with me for now. Uh, and so I, I wanted to, uh, to say that, you know, don't implement this yourself. Use the uh, uh, stacking regressor or stacking classifier in scikit-learn because it does the cross trick uh, well. Because uh, if you implement this yourself, uh, most likely you, you it, it's, it's going to be hard to do the, the, the cross fits. Gerd, can I ask a quick question from myself? Uh, yeah. Uh, in, uh, in a previous lecture, Black Richard told us, like, you know, like uh, the, the reason why deep learning works, works well is the, the stacking of the layers is when there is a hierarchical aspect in the problem. So you, uh, you, you start to get some, uh, some low level features and then those low level features are like a combined and, and so on and so on. Is there some equivalent thinking and following up on the canvas question in terms of like a model stacking? Well, I think I agree with Blake. Uh, I think uh, the reason deep learning has worked extremely well on the modalities where it works, it has worked extremely well is because there, there is a hierarchical aspect. If you take uh, a vision, there is a hierarchical aspect. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna look, a, you're gonna learn a set of different features that are more and more abstract. I don't think model stacking really captures this. And I think model stacking uh, is a way of getting more expressive models by combining two models, enhance benefiting of uh, the good properties of the two models. And typically, I'm running ahead of myself, but typically what we're gonna do is that we're gonna use model one to be a linear model and model one, because it's a linear model, it will deal extremely well with extremely high dimensional data. Uh, but it's a linear model, so it's, uh, so if, you know, if we're trying to, to predict brain aging from brain images, there's, there's a nonlinear aspect to brain aging, whether it's, it's a developmental or whether it's a normal aging. Um, and, and so typically, you know, what, what we would do if it would to, it'd be to do, you know, old style uh, linear model is we would do a nonlinear transform of Y uh, to adapt it so that it's on a, a scale that is more suited to linear model. Uh, uh, so now what we can do is that we can use a linear model on brain images that are extremely high dimensional. You know, I have a thousand samples and I have 500,000 features. I can't learn a nonlinear model directly on this. It's too high dimensional. So I'm going, I'm going to use a linear model uh, 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 in the first step and it's going to, uh, uh, you know, project my brain images to single dimension uh, um, a summary uh, of the brain images that is uh, uh, trained in a supervised way to explain age. However, it doesn't explain age well because there are those nonlinear effects. And then in the second step, I'm going to correct this with uh, a gradient boosting classifier, a gradient boosting regressor, for instance. This is typically what we do. We do this very often. And I'll come back to this. Thank you. And there's no hierarchy there. It's more a question of having a more powerful model while avoiding an overfit with the huge dimensionality of the first of the inputs. 
I'll, I'll give a more, a more advanced example after. Thanks a lot. Now, missing values. Uh, uh, the first thing is that missing values uh, in their traditional sense are mm, not an imaging thing. Uh, I personally make the difference between dead pixels or a, 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 a dead a slice on an image and a missing value because um, uh, it's more a historical thing, but missing values appear a lot in databases and questionnaires uh, and they're, they're typically related to the way you acquire your, the data. Do you, do you ever get to fill in surveys? Uh, and in a survey, there's a question that you don't like. It's asking you your age and you don't want to show your age, or it's a question that it's hard for you to answer. For instance, you know, what's your job? And there, there are four possible boxes you can tick. And I'm like, well, I'm a machine learning researcher. I don't really fit in any of those boxes. In which case, well, you're just not going to answer the survey because you're doing this on a sheet of paper and you're going to hand in the sheet of paper without, uh, uh, you know, giving the information. That creates missing values. And those missing values are quite structured. Uh, so typically you get a huge amount of these in databases. And now there's a very classic uh, theory of statistics on missing value and the model is the following. The model is that there is a complete data generating process and that there is a random process that includes those entries. So A, there is my complete data generating process and B, there is my random process including the, the entries. And there is a very powerful set of results, theoretical results that tell us that if for non-observed value, the probability of missingness does not depend on this non-observed value, then I can basically do my statistics, my normal statistics, my ma maximum likelihood statistics, while ignoring the unobserved value. And if I do this, I will get the maximum likelihood of model A. The idea being that basically, if those missing values are basically lost at random, this is known as a missing at random, there's a lost at random, then I can ignore them and I can use all kinds of tricks to ignore them. And, and there is the even more uh, favorable situation, which is the situation of missing completely at random, is that the missingness is completely independent of X. This is a very comfortable situation. However, when the missingness is dependent on X, so for instance, if I'm asked to uh, give my income and I'm less likely to give my income if I'm high income, then I certainly cannot ignore it. And I certainly cannot use tricks that try to replace it uh, uh, and do my statistics because then I will get a biased estimate of my complete data generative model. So to give you intuitions, if I have my complete data, uh, which is here a cloud of points, and com missing completely at, at, at random we, means that my partially observed values uh, 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 are you know, randomly sampled from my data distribution. While missing not at random means I have censoring, okay? And so by the way, if I have missing completely at random, I can also do, uh, I can also throw away my values that are missing and then do my statistics so, you know, I, I have partial observations. I have, I have data where I have only partial observations. If I have missing completely at random, I can throw away my data with partial observations and I can fit my model on the, on the remainder. Uh, this might be a problem because if I have uh, um, data that has a huge amount of features and each feature is missing only a small amount of times, but uh, when um, uh, uh, I, I, I try to take the, the samples with all the features, then I'm, I'm losing you know, 90% of my data. That's often the case. Then I, I can't do this trick of throwing away the data with missing values. And, but the thing is, if I have missing not at random values, if I, if I you know, focus only on my fully observed uh, 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 observations, then I'm creating a terrible bias in my distribution. So that's the classic statistic uh, uh, point of view. You mean ignoring just the feature missing or the sample that has a feature missing? Uh, when I say uh, focusing on the fully observed um, uh, um, data, I mean 
the entire sample. And the reason people might want to do this is that they just can't fit the model because there's no value there. So I, I just can't run my model on, on a, a, a feature vector that's incomplete where I have a, I have a XXX and blah in the middle. The, the software won't run and there's a, there's a good reason why the software won't run. So uh, this is, does this term permits to detect if somebody has hidden data? Uh, I, I don't really, uh, uh, the, the answer would be no, even though I don't fully understand your question. The answer would be no, because this model has a, actually a very, um, this theorem has a very strong uh, uh, restriction. And the point being that this very strong restriction, which is both that there is a complete data generating process, uh, which by, by itself is wrong, because if I'm, I'm doing statistics and I'm asking the age of your firstborn, well, some people don't have a firstborn, so you know they put nothing. Uh, trial rejected because a movement artifact would be missing this ignorable or not ignorable? Ha, huh. well, that kind of depends. If uh, the movement is completely uncorrelated to the outcome you're interested in, then it would be ignorable. If however people nod each time you ask them a question, a hard question and not an easy question, then it's uh, not ignorable. So you can see the problem. There, very often the missingness is not ignorable. It's not, uh, yeah, ignorable. Uh, and uh, so, so the point being that the missing at random is actually quite infrequent. It's the one where we have good theory, but it's quite infrequent. And there's another point, which is that anyhow, we do not need this theory because we do machine learning. And I'll come back to this. So the classic approach to solve this problem, and the one that is used everywhere, including in, in neuroimaging, is to fill in the information. Uh, and if I, if, for instance, if I have a brain image and I have just a slice missing, then I can easily fill in the information from the two neighboring slides. If I have a, 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 a time series uh, of brain images, so a, a 40 image, and one of those is missing, then I can, I can fill in the information using you know, the fact that there is some, some temporal smoothness. And in more in general, I can learn to fill in the information. So this is known in, in statistics as imputation. And the, the point that is quite important is to go back to this, this, this uh, uh, point that I was make, making on missing at random, is that imputation will give you unbiased estimates only if you're missing at random. If you're not missing at random, imputation in general cannot work. There are specific cases where it can work, but in general, it cannot work. So basically, the theory works for missing it. So uh, we'll, if we're gonna do machine learning, we're gonna have a train set and a test set. So we're going to need imputation procedures that work on the test set. And there's the specific case, special case uh, um, uh, of univariate imputation, which is the mean imputation, which is just to say, I'm going to replace missing values by the mean of the feature. This can be done in scikit-learn with a simple imputer. And then there's conditional imputation. Conditional imputation models one feature as a function of the others. And uh, scikit-learn has an, impl uh, an implementation that uses uh, uh, learners to learn the multiple features. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a nice imputation in the sense that it can uh, uh, learn that, that you know, there's a, a dependency between age, weight, uh, uh, IQ, all these things, and it can try to complete the, the missingness. And in statistics, conditional imputation is considered as the good thing to do. And even, even more than this, we can go in more details, but we won't. The point being that we've recently studied this in detail, and in machine learning, uh, it's a very different trade-off. And the reason that is, is that if you use a powerful nonlinear learner, then the powerful nonlinear learner can learn that the imputed value it is, is a specific case. And this is actually very powerful because if you use a powerful learner and you expose the, the fact that there is a missing value to the learner, then it can work in missing not at random situations. So basically, if I am not answering my income uh, each time I ask what my income is because I'm, I'm trying to hide that I'm doing tax fraud, 
uh, if uh, I'm doing supervised learning and I have many examples of people doing this with knowing whether they've done tax fraud or not, the learner can basically learn that hiding this information is an indicator of tax fraud, okay? So it's a very different regime than, than classical statistics. And I see on situations that are probably not ignorable, you know, class, classically on, on population imaging settings, I see way too many papers, including papers by extremely famous groups that just do imputation and then move on. So the, the reason why people hate, by the way, mean imputation is because it completely distorts the data distribution. Here you've seen a mean imputed data and you can see that it is extremely distorted. You can clearly see which points have been imputed. The point being that if you use a powerful nonlinear learner, it doesn't matter. The nonlinear learner will adapt to this. And we, we, we've shown this with formal proofs that in, in the, there are a few um, assumptions. One of them is you need a lot of data and the other one is that you need uh, a powerful learner. Now, let's go back to powerful learners and let's go back to tree-based uh, learners. There is this, this technique in tree-based learner that is known as missing incorporated attribute, which is to say that in the tree, each time you make a decision, you're going to consider, so each time you make a decision, usually you have the answer is yes or no, but you're going to consider yes, no, or, or missing value. And so while you learn the tree, you learn, you know, what should I do if the feature is present, and above my threshold, present, and below my threshold, and missing. So you learn those decisions on the train set. And, and then on the test set, you basically walk down the street and apply your rule. Uh, so this is known as missing incorporated attributes, and it's in, in, integrated in the histogram uh, gradient boosting classifier and regressor in scikit learn. And so, uh, uh, we've also uh, shown with theoretical arguments that this is actually an extremely uh, 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 appealing strategy and it can capture a lot of adversarial uh, missingness. And so here I'm just showing you uh, some very simple uh, simulations and uh, you can see so conditional, uh, so you can see mean imputation, you can see conditional imputation or, or, or iterative imputation, they're the same thing. Uh, and here bigger is better. Uh, and you can see uh, missing incorporated attribute. And so what you can see is that if I have a lot of data, and this is a missing completely at random situation. What you can see is that if I have a lot of data, everything converges to the same thing, including mean, which is considered as bad often, uh, uh, but uh, uh, missing incorporated attribute gets there faster. And iterative imputer gets there faster than mean. Now, if I consider a pathological case, I'm, I'm gonna go a bit faster in the interest of time, but if I consider a pathological case where, uh, the fact that some data is missing is actually, actually helps predicting why. Uh, uh, then um, if we think about this, and basically if, if why is only dependent on whether the, the, the data is missing or not, then uh, imputing perfectly makes the decision impossible because it basically lost this information. So there's one trick uh, that uh, we can add uh, a, a missing indicator. So the idea being that not only do we impute, but we also add a column that says whether or not the, the feature is missing, okay? So that way we don't lose this information. And now if I simulate data in such settings, what you can see is that mean imputation works well. And the reason is that the learner uh, learn that mean is a specific value. Uh, that iterative uh, imputer works extremely poorly. And if you just do iterative imputer, if you just do sophisticated imputation with nothing else, it actually doesn't work, right? You can see that even with a huge amount of data, it doesn't predict. And if I add an indicator, it works, but it's harder. It needs more sample because the, the information is being diluted. And you can see that missing incorporated attributes uh, actually works extremely well. So maybe, let, let me give a few, a few take home messages on this part, which are the recommendations. I will stand by them as I will, you know, defend them as someone with a, a lot of experience, both in applied machine learning and, and the theory of machine learning. Uh, 
uh, but of you might find counterexample to these. But in general, if you have very high dimensional settings with features larger than thousands, you should basically use linear models. If you have lower dimensions and a large number of samples, I would just advise you to use graded boosted regression trees. They work extremely well, unless you have a stupid amount of samples, you know, hundred thousands, in which case you should consider uh, deep learning. Uh, Ensembling, so I forgot to mention this, but ensembling is what we, is the name that, that we give when we do random forest or gradient boosting, is that we combine many, many, many uh, uh, models. This reduces the variance, and we'll come back to this, but assembling is a very useful trick, such as a bagging, uh, a bootstrap ensembling, bootstrap aggregation ensembling, which is using random forest. If you have missing values and you use very simple models such as linear models, I suggest you use an iterative imputer and you add the mask. If you have missing values and you use a powerful learner such as the trees, then you just use the integrated support of missing values inside the trees, the missing incorporated attribute. It works much better. Any questions on this? So you do have a couple of questions, I think, uh, Gael. Um, uh, just to verify, a trial rejected because of a movement artifact in EG would be a missingness ignorable or not ignorable for a neuroimaging example? I think I, I answered this question and I said that uh, if, the, if, if, the, if the movement is completely unrelated to the different um, outcomes we're interested in, then it's ignorable. If the okay. movement is related, uh, so basically if I, if, I, if I squint my eyes each time you ask me a hard question, or, each, or if you, you're looking at my error, you're asking questions and I'm making errors. Yeah, it was answered. So it's really about, so th by the way, the, the point being that those assumptions are impossible to check. Either you know the data very well and you can postulate them, or you cannot. But if you, if you know the data very well, you can postulate them. Auditory motor cortex, in this case, so not ignorable. Absolutely not ignorable. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Th thank you. Sorry, I missed the answer on that one. Um, no one. Yeah. Basically, anything that's a hardware, uh, 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 a random hardware failure, tends to be not ignorable. Uh, uh, or a typo, it tends to be not ignorable, unless it's the, the person who uh, the person who is surveyed who makes the typo, in which case, you know, people with lower socioeconomical uh, uh, status or, or dyslexic people make more typos. Uh, any of these extremely unstructured uh, uh, um, uh, uh, missingness are ignorable. Anything else is not. If you have, Jake is asking a question, if you have enough uh, subjects but a lot of features, by reducing the uh, uh, dimensions, could you make a data set more con uh, conductive to a gradient boosted approach? Absolutely. This is a very good suggestion, and this is typically one reason why we use stacking. And I'll uh, illustrate this uh, in the next few slides. I will move forward, and I'll, I'll cover uh, the next few slides, and then uh, we can, we can, I'll take a few more other questions. So now I'm going to instantiate those IDs uh, uh, on, on brain imaging. Uh, and the first thing I already mentioned it is feature clustering. Uh, uh, so uh, the idea being that uh, if I have a very large brain image, uh, you know, these days we have extremely large brain images. If I have a very large brain image, and uh, the, the problem is my, my number of, uh, of uh, features is going to be in the several hundred thousands. It, it's, it gives all kinds of problems. One of them is tractability, everything is very expensive. Another one is just good, um, uh, statistical. We, we get uh, uh, overfit extremely fast. So uh, what I'll do is I'll learn a clustering on this. So my, the clustering I'm learning is basically a set you know, of small uh, 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 parcels in the brain, and then I'll average the signal on each parcel. This can be done with a Sklern cluster feature agglomeration. And so one thing that we did a few years ago was that we did extremely fast uh, clusterings uh, that would work on extremely large brain images. 
And uh, the idea being that we're uh, iteratively merging in a very fast way voxels with their neighbors. Uh, we call this RENA. And to give you an illustration, basically we're iteratively doing this, this merge. And at the end of the day, we get a set of uh, clustered voxels. And we call this a representation, we call it a compressed representation because you can see that, so what I've done here is that I've represented the original data uh, with the average value on each cluster. So really what we've done is we've done uh, what was known in computer vision as super pixels or super voxels. And we've uh, um, uh, replaced the, the, the original feature vector by the, 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 the values on, on this uh, voxel. So this is implemented uh, on these super voxels. This is implemented in Nylearn, uh, in a Nylearn that region the parcellation, and you can choose RENA uh, as an option if you want the thing to go extremely fast. Now, uh, this, by the way, will probably be suboptimal because your, your clustering will be suboptimal because having an optimal clustering is uh, something that I consider is pretty much infeasible. It's an extremely hard problem. Uh, but it goes back to a trick I mentioned earlier. What we're going to do is that we're going to do assembling. We're going to assemble many, many suboptimal models. Uh, uh, so we're going to apply this clustering many, many times, uh, uh, perturbing a bit the data. Each time we're going to get a different set of super voxel. We're going to get a reduced dimensionality with it. We're going to get, we're going to estimate linear models on this, or we could, if we reduced hugely, we could estimate gradient, uh, we could estimate tree gradient boosting models. However, we typically, we only reduce by a factor of 10 the number of features, because we don't want to lose too much uh, uh, um, spatial information. And then at the end of the day, we average the predictions. So this is um, an ensemble model that combines the ID of uh, um, the feature agglomeration with the ID uh, of, of ensemble. And so we've compared this to uh, uh, um, other work that use spatial penalties and uh, so spatial penalties are fancy ways of capturing the dependencies between, between voxels. And it works as well or better than spatial penalties. But the, 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 the benefit is that it gives extremely stable uh, weights. And it's, it's back to the idea that uh, assembling actually reduces the variance hugely. So we, I've, I've ended up liking assembling a lot because it's extremely robust. Uh, and the reason really is that we're perturbing the data and we're learning a model. So, and we're learning many, many models. So by construction, we're robust to data perturbation. And another pleasant thing is that this is reasonably fast because RENA is extremely fast. So this will be implemented in Nyland very soon. We have a, a pull request for this. We call this FREM. And now, uh, last but not least, let me go back to stacking. And let me introduce to you a, an architecture that we've been uh, uh, using for the last few years, each time we have rich uh, multimodal uh, uh, data uh, that's based on stacking. Uh, and the idea being that on each imaging modality, uh, we are going to fit a linear model, for instance, to predict brain age from fMRI, uh, to predict brain age from structural uh, MRI, and then, uh, uh, in a second step, we're going to use a tree model. So basically using a, a stacking approach, we're going to use a, a tree model to assemble the different information that we have in the first step to predict our final uh, uh, outcome. Uh, so really we're using one linear model to predict age from fMRI. One linear model to predict age, well, oh, I hadn't seen that I put age as a feature. Well, okay. One linear model to predict IQ from fMRI. One linear model to predict IQ uh, 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 from structural uh, uh, MRI. And then we also want to take into account uh, age because uh, um, age uh, has an impact on, on um, uh, some measures of IQ or socioeconomical status or other sociodemographics. And then those, because they're already extremely low dimensionals, those, those um, uh, those socio sociodemographic features, 
we add them in the second step of the stacking. And finally, we combine all this information using um, a, a tree-based model, such as a gradient uh, boosted uh, a tree. Uh, this, in our experience, works extremely well. Kendra is asking, if there is higher weight stability in a model, does that give you more license to interpret which features are more important? Or is it as just, just as black boxes models with lower weight stability? It's a very good question. And actually, the reason why we, we, we did the previous work right here, the friend, is, is really to interpret uh, those uh, weights. And in the paper, we make a case that those are interpretable. And we have more recent work uh, that's based on quite a lot of theory that shows that uh, those weights actually come with some form of statistical guarantee. So you can basically you can see the bootstrapping that we're doing in this in the assembling because it's based at some point on a bootstrapping. So bootstrapping, for those who don't know, is randomly uh, uh, selecting a subset of um, of uh, uh, samples, of observations. So you can see that, that the bootstrapping that we're doing actually uh, acts as a weight of testing a bit the uh, basic, basically computing some um, uh, form of posteriors uh, uh, on, the, on, the, um, uh, on the parameters. Uh, so, so yes, indeed, they do help interpreting. This is why we, we went uh, to this. Uh, so to, to go back to the, the stacking approach, uh, so, so we're using stacking really to combine extremely high dimensional information uh, uh, with lower dimension in information. And the other thing is that we're, we're using stacking to avoid uh, uh, um, uh, trying to fit the co, um, the co dependencies the covariations of fMRI and structural MRI. It may make sense, by the way, for fMRI and structural MRI, but we've done this for, for instance, uh, fMRI and, and MEG. It's not that it doesn't make sense, it's that because we have a limited set of data, we need to reduce the complexity of our, of our model, and hence we shouldn't be trying to fit every single dependency. And uh, uh, very recently, and I think this will be um, in the final publication soon, uh, um, we, um, uh, so we, we worked on multimodal data where only a fraction of the modality was present uh, for each subject. And this is very often the case because if you're trying to scan a thousand subjects and you want three modalities, you know, MEG, fMRI, and anatomical MRI to be present on all those subjects, you're going to lose some data, you know, some person won't have a usable fMRI because he or she moved. Some person won't have a usable MEG because the MEG machine was not working on this day. Uh, and so what we did is that in the, in the last step, in the, in the, 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 great, the, 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 the gradient boosting model, we basically coded the absence of each modality with missing values. And so with this, we're able to have a multimodal uh, approach that is robust to missingness of, uh, of a modality. This was the reason why, well, this was one reason why I mentioned uh, uh, um, um, missing values. But it's also important in the sociodemographics, right? Here I, I showed age, but you, you can add a lot of other information in sociodemographics. And when you're doing uh, population imaging, that's quite important because this is how you're describing uh, your subjects. Is this in preprints somewhere? Of course, we always do preprints. So yes, uh, you can, uh, there's a reference at the end, at the, yeah, at the end of the slides, and you can uh, look at the preprint. Or you can just wait a, wait, a week. Uh, well, I'm running out of time, so um, I can uh, skip to the end, or I can cover a bit uh, uh, wider, uh, principles of machine learning. What should I do? I think if you have the energy and if the uh, uh, the students have also the energy, I would uh, love to. We, uh, again, we what we have after you is uh, more like a discussion and uh, you know going back to some questions that uh, or topics that people would like to have a bit more information on. So so uh, I would recommend that you uh, you know take your time and, and and finish what you wanted to tell to tell us. This is super useful. Okay, so what I, what I'll talk about 
uh, right now is somewhat repeating, I think, things that have been said, but with the, the idea of putting slightly more theory on them, not too much, but slightly. And the first point being, uh, so we're, we're going to consider a regression because uh, and we're going to consider a, a, a single dimensional regression. Uh, and um, we can fit, you know, different models. And so which one do you prefer? I usually ask this question. Well, you can reply in the chat. Which one do you prefer, the straight line or the wiggly line? Go ahead. The first, which is, which one, straight or wiggly? Okay, so I get a few straights. But left, you do agree right. with me. No, no, left or right doesn't work. Not for me. <laughs> but, but I mean, you're all saying straight, but it really doesn't fit the data as well, right? It fits the data quite poorly, whereas the other fits the data very well. So from a, an intuitive standpoint, it is true that most people have the intuition that the straight line is to be preferred to the, to the wiggly line. However, if I were to give you error rates, yes, overfitting, thank you, Emily. Indeed, that's perfect overfitting. The thing is, people do this all the time. They look at the error of their model and they say, this model has a little error, hence it is better all the time. Yes, so it's overfitting. You've already seen this. Minimizing the error is not always the best strategy. And the reason is because the test data is different from the trained data. And so the, idea, the intuition being that if I would sample more data and display it on screen, then uh, uh, the straight line would fit better than the wiggly line. And so uh, there's this concept of regularization it's a, it's a broad concept in, in, in machine learning, which is that we're going to prefer simple models where simple model is, is to be defined. And each family of model comes in with its own notion of simplicity. Here, the, the simplicity is, is how smooth the, the, the line is, which is a you know, valid uh, simplicity uh, model. Uh, so that's the, the, the core ID behind machine learning. It's the core ID behind every single uh, aspect of machine learning, and uh, uh, and it's this mistake is present in so many papers that I review. Usually these days it's hidden, it's not obvious. But when you think about it, there's an argument somewhere that is basically my model works better because it has minimized an error, and there's not proper cross validation. So, by the way, this is a typical bias variance trade off. I can use an extremely flexible model, in which case it's going to have no bias because it's going to be able to fit everything, but it's going to have a lot of variance. Or I can use the bias model, in which case it will be biased. It won't be able to fit, for instance, high frequency uh, uh, oscillations in the, in the example of smoothness. Uh, uh, but this, this uh, bias, if it's well chosen, will help it uh, not fit uh, the noise. So there's another problem uh, which makes it worse is that we seldom have only a single feature. We usually have many features, many parameters, in which case uh, the, the, the simple picture that I've shown you becomes more complex because we are now trying to predict y from two features. So that's a you know, 2D plus one problem or maybe 10,000 features. So then it's a 10,000 plus one dimensional problem. Now, if you try to Try to think with me in 10,000 dimension. I can assure you it's feasible. It's taken me a few years, but now I can do it. So if you think in 10,000 dimensions and if you picture a thousand data points in 10,000 dimension, okay, maybe it's hard, but then, you know, just picture two data points in three dimension. If you picture two data points in three dimension, you can see the problem, right? I can fit any hyperplane I want in there. Now, uh, if you, you extrapolate uh, uh, from this and you uh, picture uh, uh, a thousand data points in 10,000 dimension, I can fit a crazy amount of linear models in there, and you're not even mentioning nonlinear models. So that's the core problem. That's the core reason why if I don't have a very large number of samples compared to my number of features, I can very easily fit models that are nonsensical. It's known as the curse of dimensionality in machine learning. Now, let me give you a tiny amount of statistical formulation because uh, uh, 
uh, you don't see it often in papers, but there is a statistical theory that can underlie supervised learning. And I won't go in details through it, but if you want to show things for supervised learning, this is the way you, you position the problem. Bear with me, it's just one slide. The, 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 the problem setting is you're given two you're given pairs of data, X and Y, for instance, X being brain image, Y being age, that are drawn randomly. Drawn randomly is what we do statisticians because this is what we need to prove things. Uh, and then the, the problem is to find a, a, a function that goes from X to Y such that F of X is close to Y for a certain notion of close, okay? And that certain notion of close will depend on my application. One approach to do this, not the only one, but one approach is that I'm given a loss function, which is a cost of error on Y. And I will estimate F by minimizing this cost between the, the prediction and the real data. Okay, so I'm just minimizing the cost between the prediction and the real data. And my goal is to minimize the expected cost. So the cost on random draws of the data that I don't know, all the random possible draws. I would like to minimize my error between my prediction of age and the subject age, given all the possible subjects that I might ever scan. And by the way, if I choose the right uh, cost for this, if I, I, then I can, I can have that the uh, prediction uh, of age is the conditional expectancy which is convenient in statistics. An important point is that the inference that we're doing and the statistical control is on F. It's not on the parameters. It is on the predictions of F. It is not on the parameters. So basically I can conclude, I can statistically conclude, control my brain age and its error, but it's extremely hard to control the ingredients of my predictor. And those ingredients of my predictor is if I'm doing brain imaging might be the regions that I've selected. It's extremely hard. There are a few cases where in theory we can do it, but it's very, very hard. Now, let's go back to the intuitions. We are setting there, we're given data and we're trying to learn a function that does prediction. And our goal is to minimize an error. Actually, our goal is to minimize an expected error. However, we can only, only measure an error on the data points that we have. We're not measuring this expected error. Never, we have 100 data points, we have 1,000 data points. Well, we don't have the full distribution. And this is the reason why when we minimize the error on those data points, we can overfit because we're minimizing on the sample. We're not minimizing on the distribution. As Neil Bohr said, you know, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. The solution is to bias W, to bias, basically to bias my function, and here the weights of my function, towards a more plausible solution. Okay? And the, 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 the point being that this more plausible solution makes my empirical error closer to my expected error. And now how to choose this is a vast story, which is many different branches to the story, which is called statistical machine learning, and I will not cover. And maybe a last point, and maybe you've already heard me mention this. Uh, this last point is that most of our conclusion when we do machine learning draw their validity on empirical evidence that the thing works. Basically, oh, I've done a complicated pipeline that stacked three times histogram boosted classifiers and did this and this and this, but I'm showing you that I do cross-validation and it works. And so please accept my paper. However, cross-validation is like everything else. It's a statistical estimate of my actual generalization error. It is not a oracle measure of how well my pipeline would perform on new data. And 
as any estimate, it's limited by the amount of data it has seen. So if I give, if I test a classifier on 30 samples, it's like rolling, it's like flipping a coin 30 times. I'm flipping a coin 30 times. And if I'm flipping a coin 30 times, I only get a limited quality on the estimate uh, of, the, of uh, the, the, the chance that the, the coin has to be head or tails. And that this, this distribution is, is easy to compute. It's a binomial distribution. And so we can look at the evolution of, uh, of uh, this, is, this. These are Monte Carlo simulations. They're not binomial distributions, but they're pretty close. We can look at uh, uh, the, the, how this distribution evolves with a number of samples. And where I would like to, to draw your attention is the width of this distribution. If I have a thousand data points, which is much more than most uh, uh, experiments in your imaging, the distribution is still, uh, still a width of plus and minus 3%. So if I'm publishing my sophisticated pipeline saying, you know, yes, I can show you empirically with my experiments that it has a gain of 2% over the linear model, I don't have a publication. I have no evidence because 2% is completely explained by chance. Now, what makes things worse is uh, that if we, if we try many things, varying trivial details, such as the amount of smoothing, uh, one classifier versus another one that are quite similar, what we're going to do when we, when we do this, we randomly try many, many, many things, is that we're going to explore this noise. And I've shown you here for different sizes of data, I've shown you trying out many different variations of an actually fairly reasonable pipeline. Nothing that would make me think, oh, wow, that's, that's strange. Uh, uh, and so what you can see is that the, the, the width of this uh, uh, distribution is, is quite wide. It's, restating what I've said before. But now, if I were to choose my best performer and publish, I'd get, I, I, I would report an extremely good performance, even though on this specific data set, I, when I ran this experiment, I permitted the label so that there was absolutely no signal. So on a data set with absolutely no signal, on trying a bunch of uh, by trying a bunch of different classifiers, I can report something absolutely splendid. It's nothing but sampling noise. But of course, people would never do that, and this will never happen. This is a graph of the reported prediction accuracy as a function of the cohort size on which people were working in publications for different uh, pathologies, where connectome learning is a very specific set of pathology that I have. Uh, and what you can see is that on average, the larger the cohort, the smaller people report uh, 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 predictive accuracy. The way I personally interpret this is that they have less possibility of exploring degrees of freedom, and they're more constrained by their data. So unfortunately, I do believe that many people are unwittingly uh, uh, exploring those, those researchers' degrees of freedom. Uh, and this is one reason why uh, these days I'm a bit worried by uh, part of my job, which is uh, designing new models on brain imaging data, because I'm worried that if I keep doing it, I will basically overfit uh, my uh, um, data sets and I need new data sets to validate those models. Uh, so word of caution when you're trying things out. Uh, with this, I'll end and take questions. Uh, if you want to go further, uh, you can have a look at the um, uh, chapter on, on statistics and actually also on machine learning in the SciPy lecture notes is very hands-on, uh, but it gives you a uh, way, it, it, it illustrates some of the concepts I've mentioned uh, uh, for, um, uh, with Python. 
Uh, and and if if uh, you want to learn a, a lot about machine learning, just um, learn read the, um, uh, the the documentation of Scikit-Learn. If it's it's basically an encyclopedia by now. If you know all of it, you know a lot. Gail, thank you so much. That's uh, you know like uh, giving us your experience after so many years in this uh, field is uh, invaluable. Uh, so really uh, uh, a big thank. Uh, I don't know, do we have more questions at that stage? No, you get... Uh... Yeah, the slides will be there. I've pushed them. I, I added a few things. Yeah, yeah, no, I've pushed them. I'll yeah, yeah, they are already, uh, the slides are already on the, uh, on the uh, Git repo of the, uh, of the course. So uh, uh, you should be able to see them now uh, and just uh, pull the repo and you get the, the guide slides. Um, I don't, uh, I think- Andrea is asking a very good question. Uh, she's asking, should it become practice to do permutation-based null models when you claim some accuracy? Yes, it should, of course. There's a drawback is that permutations are expensive. And uh, there's currently there's a race where people are using more and more expensive model. Yes, I'm eyeing deep learning models and they can't validate them. They simply don't have the budget to validate them. Uh, uh, I, I think this is extremely bad. And this is why you know, I started my presentation by computational aspects. Uh, in general, not only permutation, but in general, you should, you should shake your model as much as possible. You know, permute, bootstrap, you basically see how it works. However, this will not prevent against researcher degrees of freedom. Because if you're trying out many, many things, uh, you're increasing your uh, uh, your prediction accuracy. Uh, so your your permutation, your null distribution isn't changed, but you're increasing. So if you try try many many things, you eventually get out of the, the permutation. You the fact that stack models don't overfit is still a bit unintuitive. No, that they can overfit, of course. <laughs> yeah, 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 they can overfit. Uh, the 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 reason why they don't stupidly and vastly overfit uh, is because of the crossfit uh, trick. And this crossfit trick is a bit hard to explain, but I'll try to get back to it. The crossfit trick being that you don't actually train model one on the full data. Well, not on the full train data. You train model one on a fraction of the, of the, of the, of the train data. Then, uh, so you train model one on, on uh, four fifths of the train data, and then you predict on the left outfit. And this is Z, and then you change. And so you're basically, on your train data, you're basically uh, constructing Z each time as a prediction on new data, new data being a subset of this data. You never, in uh, stacking, you never, during the training, uh, use the prediction of the model on its own data. You know, that's something, it's, it's unhealthy in machine learning to do this. Uh, and and take a message is just use the learn ensemble stacking uh, regressor. It does this right. Uh, you have a lot of thanks, uh, Gail. Uh, you also could you uh, use the column of missingness in an adversarial way? What do you mean? Use the column of missing in an adversarial way. Uh, so we'll wait for a bit more uh, explanation on this one. Um, okay. Unlearn the missingness while learning. Okay, so yeah, so it goes back to a question I had earlier: is basically people wanting to impute. Um, um, so basically, you, you might, you, you know, there's this idea that oh, this missingness is annoying me. I've uh, I've grown to love missingness. Uh, I don't care about missingness, and it's back to the to the point that. Uh, I'm no longer trying to interpret my models the way people interpret classical statistical models, where they basically feel they, they're controlling and understanding every weight of the model. I'm only interpreting the predictions of the model. Oh, maybe I should, I should mention, uh, okay, I'm only interpreting the predictions of the model, but I still want some feature importance. A feature importance is, is important for me because I want so that there are two reasons why feature importance might be imp uh, important to you. There is one of them, which is the classic one, is actually, I'm, I'm claiming I'm doing machine learning, but what I really want to do is I want to claim to have conclusions about causal links between my brain and my, uh, and my outcome. And, and the reason why I want causal links is because I'm, I'm thinking that I can, 
I, I can deduce something about, about a feature of the brain and, and the outcome. It's a very, very common case. That is mostly outside of any guarantees of learning theory. That is mostly using tools, not for what they've been uh, 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 built. Uh, and it, if, if you want to do this, you, you need to control what you're doing extremely well. Uh, when I, I say this, uh, neuroimagers are often unhappy, uh, and, and but, but, but that's unfortunate. Sure. And, and now if you have missingness there, uh, it better be extremely kind missingness. It better be missingness at random elsewhere you will uh, have challenges. Another reason why you want to interpret the features of your classifier is just to debug it because um, you might have things in your data that you haven't realized you have in your data. Uh, that's a very common case. If you, do, if, if you want to do this, there is a very nice thing that's called permutation importance. Permutation importance is the idea that you have, you take a trained classifier and then you take the test set and you're going to measure the performance of the classifier on the, trust, on the test set using the full test set and then permuting the values of one feature. And you look at how, how much it drops, okay? So you permit value of feature one, a feature two, or feature three, and each time you see how it drops. And this gives you how important the feature was for uh, the prediction. Now, what, what I like about this is that it's, it treats the classifier as a black box. It doesn't need much about how you constructed your classifier, it just needs it to work. All right, um, we're approaching uh, three o'clock, uh, which is, uh, it's been a long time for you guys and for Gael. Uh, Gael, thanks again so much. That was uh, awesome. Uh, you have uh, well deserved. I think you probably will have a, a dinner now or something. Uh, this is so well deserved. Um, so thanks again. That's, uh, you know, like uh, it, was, it was really a treat. Um, uh, and uh, and yes, and uh, you know, like uh, if there are more questions for you, then we will just forward that in the chat or in the in the, in the Slack if if you uh, if you want to to see that.